My challenge to you is don't worry about people helping you. Why don't you start looking to serve and help others and make your focus of stop being a lone wolf, not about you and how it benefits you or may or may not be good for you. Actually focus on what are you doing for others? What model are you setting for your daughters and your kids around the idea that living a life of fulfillment and purpose is often found in the service of others? Kip, what's up, brother? So great to see you. I am having a time over here. Oh my goodness. I had like a sneeze attack right as I got on the call with you and my brand new puppies chewing on cables and <laughs> things are unplugged. What in the world is happening right now? Yeah. I can't. I, Anyways. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I'm like mad scrambling for headphones. I'm like, how do I never, I always put them in my bag. Bluetooth's not in my bag. So I had to go old school wired in. But uh, it's been a little bit of a chaotic, chaotic Monday. One of those, one of those Mondays, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Well, good, that man. Happens. It's good to see you. I was going to show you a couple of things <clears throat> before we jump into it, because I know we're going to do headlines, and obviously there's a big headline. Well, let me say it this way. I have to say I was wrong. <laughs> I don't have to say that very often. <laughs> but two or three weeks ago, I said, there's no way Biden's dropping out of this race. And yesterday he dropped out of the race. My biggest question is if he's not competent to run for president, is he competent to be the president? And we'll talk a little bit about that. But my headlines are different. Is your, does your headline have to do with the political stuff? It doesn't. I chose something. Well, it's oh, it political, but okay. I chose something slightly different. Yeah. I did too because you know what? Like everybody's got commentary. Everybody's got stuff. I think at this point, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think – uh, Kamala Harris is going to get the nod. She's already got the support yeah. of Biden and the Clintons and other notable Democrats. <laughs> this is bad. This is bad. <laughs> there is so much we could talk about around 14 million Democratic voters uh, th- voted for, for Biden. And now all of a sudden in the DNC, you know, they're going to maybe hand select or hand pick, or maybe it's going to be Kamala. Those 14 million people didn't vote for Kamala. Yep. They voted for Biden. Yep. And there's going to be some legal battles because I think there's some illegal questions or, or legality issues that need to be addressed. But totally. this woman is, she's a very unlikable person, to put it mildly. <laughs> she's very inept at her job. So it's, but it's going to mix the race up. So it's interesting. But that's, that's a whole other conversation. I got a couple of new toys over the weekend I wanted to share. That's my headlines. <laughs> toys over the weekend. All right. I'm excited. A couple of toys over the weekend. First one, I got a brand new firearm. All right. What did you and get? And guys, if you don't have a firearm or at a minimum aren't training or at least have shot a pistol, I would say probably now is a good time to go get yourself familiar with handguns, uh, go get some training, go get some instruction and consider what your EDC is going to be. I've been using Glocks for a lot of years. I switched over to the dark side. This is my new SIG right here. You got here. a SIG. So I've a 365. I got a SIG. So I've got, this is the P365 X macro. Uh, I found one that I really liked. The only problem is the one that I really liked in a, pl- in a local gun shop that I wanted to support is they had the safety and I'm like, I don't, I don't want a safety on it. Oh, interesting. I don't, like, yeah. So okay. unfortunately, I had to go to another gun shop in a neighboring town. I found the P365 without the safety. So this is my new everyday carry. Very cool. Awesome. Excited about that. Awesome. Have not shot this one yet, but have shot the P365. Uh, <clears throat> the other one I wanted to show you, I just got a little care package from my friends over at Montana Knife Company. And this is their new... I don't know if you can see that. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Is that focusing? A little bit. This yeah. is their little bit. This is their, uh, it's called the f- uh, flat tail knife from Montana knife company. This is a collaboration with Steve Renella over at meat eater who happens to also have been a uh, past guest. But, uh, this, this new knife right here, I'm going to be using that as we go hunt in Minnesota, November. Kip, yeah. I'm trying to get a few more, so let's keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> and I think you actually have some origin gear on your way too, by, by the way, <clears throat> some camo. 
Awesome. And uh, yeah, so this is the new knife. This one drops on Thursday of this week at seven o'clock mountain time. So this is their flat tail. Uh, and that's, like I said, a collaboration with Steve Ranella over at Meat Eater. So a cool. couple of new toys. I got a new knife. I got a new gun. I got a dog over here chewing up cables. <laughs> Things are pretty good in the Mickler household. So why the switch? Why the switch from the Glock to that SIG? I'm really hesitant to share this story, but I'll share it. Okay. So <clears throat> my girlfriend and I uh, decided that we we're going to go hike in Capitol Reef. Uh, was this last week? Not, not this last week, in the previous weekend. <clears throat> and we did a nine and a half mile hike and yeah. it was brutal. She was amazing. <laughs> I think I told you guys a little bit about it. It's like, holy cow, I got some room for improvement. So we're driving there and I realized I didn't bring my gun with me. Mm. And I told her that. I'm like, I didn't bring my gun. She's like, I have two. And she had one gun in her glove box because <laughs> we ended up taking her vehicle. And then she had one that she had packed in her backpack. And it was funny because she told me the night before she had a dream that she, and I'm not kidding. This is even before I told her I didn't have my gun. This is how it got brought up that I forgot mine. Yeah. She said, I had a dream that you forgot your gun and I brought mine and you and I got into a knockdown, drag out fight because I wouldn't let you carry the gun because you forgot yours. And I got, apparently in the dream, I got really mad because she wouldn't let me carry the firearm, she had to carry the firearm. Got it. <laughs> so she brought two. And then that's what triggered it. <laughs> yeah, so that's what triggered it. I'm like, oh, shit, I did forget my firearm. And so, uh, but, but she did let me carry the firearm on our hike, and it was, the, it was the P365. And I held it, and I'm like, this actually feels, feels good. really good. It's not a compact like I was using for my EDC with a Glock. It's more of a full-size gun, shorter barrel, full-size gun. Yeah. But this is, I love this firearm so far. Yeah. I, so it's, it's her doing. Yeah. I mean, I, I know we're, we should probably get sponsored by, by, by SIG if we're going to talk about them. But, man, I tried, when I bought my 365, I tried 12 different concealed carries. And yeah. the minute I touched that in my hand, I was like, ooh, that. Just it just feels good. good, and I shot all of them, and uh, I lo yeah. I love my I love my three sixty five. It's a it's a great. The gun. thing that's nice about it, it's pretty low profile, and so like you're not going to flag it or it's not going to really profile on your waistband, but it carries seventeen rounds. Yeah, so it's a full double. St I mean, it's a full size firearm. Yeah, and it's uh, yeah, I like it. Full so, grip, none yeah. of that partial grip stuff. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, it's nice. The other one I like is um, the Springfield Hellcat, which is very similar. Yeah. Maybe it's a little bit smaller profile, but very similar to the SIG P365. So anyways, yeah. that's where we're at. That was my number is two that option. Carry? That was my number two option was the Hellcat. Oh, was it? Okay, yeah. 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 Same. Yeah. yeah. I was like, ooh, I like the Hellcat too. Yeah, that's I know, funny. It feels good. All right, that's your headline. Right, so the, that's, the sharing toys. That's kind of my headlines. <laughs> I don't care about all the other stuff. We talk about politics. We talk about that bullshit all the time. Oh, Let's have some fun today. Oh, well, then it messes up my headline because it's not fun at all. Um, but we can well, skip okay. mine. I, I just, this, no, let's hear this blew my mind, man. I mean, this is, what, six days ago. Headline reads, California Governor Gavin Newsom signs bill banning schools from notifying parents of child's gender identities. Monday, he signed a new law banning school districts from notifying parents if their children uses different pronouns or identifies as a gender that's different from what's on their school records. Obviously, and we could talk about um, a few things out of this. One thing I thought was funny is Elon Musk tweeted later that day, I believe, he says, this is a final straw because of this law and many others that precede it attacking both families and companies. SpaceX will move its headquarters from Hawthorne, California to Starbase, Texas. And the, the part that I kind of wanted to talk about is we have part of empowering people, part of believing in people um, and Part of empowering people to step up powerfully is you need to believe in people. And this concept that the government knows better than a family, better than a parent, is so, there are so many things 
wrong with that thought thought process that it's ridiculous. And and we could probably talk for hours on this, but you tell me one thing that the government has done a great job at. In fact, let's use the let's use the um oh, what is it called? The um oh my gosh, the system that kids get stuck in when when they don't have unfit parents. What am I well, I'm drawing a blank oh, here. Uh yeah. Uh, child protective services. Yeah. You tell me how good that works. Some of the most horrific scenarios are from kids being in the system. And that's run by your public government. The same government that says that a parent knowing what's best for their kids doesn't count and that they don't need to know. And that kids have some right to, to, um, that, 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 they have some right that the, that the state is willing to give them that they don't need to tell their parents or the parents shouldn't be in the know. This is pitting groups against groups. It, it is so wrong in so many ways, and I just can't believe it, man. I, I, we actually have good friends that live here in Utah, and you've heard of Acton Academies. These, those are the schools that Matt Bordeaux was part of in, yeah. in California. We have good friends that moved from California, not because he had a job in, in Utah, nothing else. They literally moved into our neighborhood so they could enroll his daughters in the same school as my two daughters because of their unwillingness to have their kids in the public school system, let alone in California's. It's, it's just ridiculous. Anyhow, I don't it is ridiculous. And, you know, frankly, I, I can't believe Newsom wasn't, I, I believe it was a recall election uh, maybe a year or two ago. I can't believe he wasn't recalled. If you're in California, what, what are you doing? Really, what are you doing? You're absolutely ridiculous. The fact that you continue to vote for this guy, this guy hates you. He hates American rights. He hates America, or at least what it stands for. And he's trying to rewrite what it is we stand for. Now, look, I'm going to try to take a different angle on this one just for a second, Kip. Yeah. Because I don't need to beat a dead horse. Like, if you hear that and you aren't infuriated, then you're, this is not the show for you. Yeah, like, you're, you're not lost, a man. Yeah. You're not acting like a man. You're not an American citizen. You're not acting like one. Like, go find something else because this ain't it at this point. Yeah. So I'll take a different angle because I think most of us are, like, beating our chest. Yeah, you're right, right? I don't think there's many people who would listen to this that would disagree with that. But the angle that I want to take on this is why it's – here, I'll say it this way. I think a lot of people who might agree with a bill like this being or a law like this being passed is because what they'll say is, well, some some parents or some kids don't have the parents they need. Some kids aren't that way. And so big daddy government becomes mommy and daddy. Yeah. To that, I would say, okay, you're probably right. There are probably million, not even probably, there are millions and millions of children who do not have an engaged, loving, supportive mother and father in the home. And by the way, supportive doesn't mean that you're going to support their mental illness. It means that you're going to support their mental health by helping them understand when it comes to sex, there are two biological sexes. And some people say, well, gender is different. It's very similar. It isn't until I think the 50s or 60s that we started introducing these radical concepts about gender and sex, whole other conversation. This is why, guys, Movements like we're doing here in Order of Man are so important because it's not wrong that there are millions of children in the U.S. without engaged fathers and mothers. That becomes our responsibility. Yeah. So if I have a neighborhood kid who is being raised by a single mother, and bless her heart, she's doing the best she can do, but the situation is what it is, then I have a responsibility, a moral responsibility, an obligation even, to take that son to take that daughter and then include them in a healthy, loving home environment. That's not to say to make them my children, but to invite them over. You know, my daughter had her, her little friend over and they have a loving home, I know that, but invited her little friend over and they spent time here. I make dinner for all of them. I engage all of them. When we go to the mall or we go run errands, my kids will often say, hey, can so-and-so come? You better believe I'm always willing to invite friends because it might be, the only environment they have. Without naming names, I have one of my sons who has a friend who doesn't have mom and dad at home. And I, 
the way I gather it, it's grandma who's raising this young man. And bless her heart, she shouldn't be in that position, but she is. And so it's my moral obligation as a man of the community to outreach my hand, to teach my kids to outreach, and then to help these young men and young women grow up in righteousness in a way, and even forget about the righteousness because that has a spiritual undertone, but a way that's gonna serve them to live a better life. Personal responsibility, accountability, discipline, hard work, commitment, sacrifice, doing the right thing when it's difficult to do, having a backbone, courage, fortitude, grit, resiliency. We have to teach our kids these things. And then when there are things like this, where there's mental illness and what I would call social contagion introduced into the mix, it's our job to repel that and to actively fight against gender ideology for example, because we know, you look at the statistics alone and we know that those people who identify as quote unquote transgender have a significantly higher rate of mental depression, anxiety, and even suicide. Now you might say correlation, causation, and not really know, but there's some mental stuff going on. And the more that we foster and encourage it, the worse it's gonna get for these young sons and daughters who might not have somebody in the home. That's our responsibility as men. Yeah. Mm, I love the take, man. The call to action. I mean, and there's so much opportunity. And we we are talking about this in the Iron Council a lot this month is a a battle to fight, right? And showing up powerfully in the world. And and what a great opportunity that we have to do that. Really just by leveling up how we show up in our communities and and, um, looking for opportunities to model certain behaviors. And and I, like one thing that came to mind when you're sharing, Ryan, is you know, our home should be a place of refuge for our kids, but also for others. It should be highly welcoming. Um, and, and that's sometimes hard to do. Like I get so many little like 13 year old girls over at my house and I'm just like, why don't you guys play (laughs) somewhere else? Right. And Asia has to remind me, she's like, do you want them all playing somewhere else? And I'm like, and is there anywhere else to play? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Totally. Well, not to mention the, you know, where I've got three boys and a, and a, and a daughter, <laughs> the food bill alone, when all the friends come <laughs> over, I'm like, damn. And there's, there's a lot of nights where I, so I use a company called HelloFresh for my food and they send a planned amount of meals per day. Like I have it planned yeah, based on what I think we'll need. And so all of a sudden I have four kids. When I have six or seven kids at, at the house, Guess who's not eating? <laughs> Me. Or I'm having leftovers or I'm running to the store real quick and trying to pick up some sushi or whatever. Yeah. Because my priority is feed those kids, including the neighborhood kids. But it gets expensive and it's time consuming, but there's a sacrifice. It's well worth it. That's our job as men. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. All right. Well, we're going to get into some questions from the Iron Council. To learn more about the Iron Council, go to orderofman.com slash Iron Council. Our first question, George Sykes. How do you process sadness, disappointment, and depression? I'm tired of treating my emotions with food, but I don't know what to do. I'll sometimes allow myself to cry, but it doesn't seem to help. Well, George, I'm glad to hear that question. Longtime member of the Iron Council, years and years he's been around. And I hope I can say, I'm gonna say it anyways, but you know, I know George has battled with with health issues and some things, ups and downs, just like we all have, right? Um, crying, I think is okay and appropriate when it's appropriate. I'm not going to sit here and say that you should never cry or you should never express emotion. I think there's real healing power in learning to let go of it. We as men tend to stuff it down. And I think that is appropriate too. At certain times, a lot of society would say, Oh, never stuff it down. And then the other half of society says, always stuff it down. I don't think one end of the extreme is, is healthy regardless of which way you go. So yeah, there's times where, you know, let it out. I'm not going to cry in front of my kids. I, I'm just not because it's inappropriate. Now, will I have conversations about the hard days I'm having or the things that I'm struggling with? Within reason, sure, of course, because I want them to know what dad does when he has these hard days. I don't want them to think I'm a superhero impervious to all of life's challenging 
times. So I'm going to be honest with them. But also, I'm also not going to offload that onto them because it's not their cross to bear. So I don't cry for that reason in front of my kids. My oldest son is very in tune with the way people are feeling. So he knows. He'll come, he came up last night and I was making dinner. And he's like, he came, gave me a hug and I came, kind of gave the one arm hug. And he's like, no, put that down. Two arms, let's go, bring it in. Like he's very attuned. And I was having a hard evening, but he's very in tune with that. Hmm. But I'm not gonna offload things that shouldn't be offloaded to my kids. So I think the first thing we need to understand is that there's times where it's appropriate to cry and let it loose with the, with the right people. Um, I, I would be very hesitant to cry and have these emotional responses with people that I have authority over. So my kids, for example, because that's going to undermine credibility and authority. Um, my partner or my spouse, I'm going to do whatever I can not to blubber and cry in front of her because that undermines credibility. And I'm not interested in undermining credibility with a partner. Now, Kip, I feel like I could probably come to you and if I really needed to have a cry or really needed to get some things off my chest or quote unquote vent, I could probably do that. But I also have no authority over you. Yeah. There, there's no leadership capacity here. I mean, maybe a little as an example, but as far as direct leadership, that's not within my purview in our relationship. So me unloading isn't going to un- undermine our relationship unless I take it to the extreme or take advantage of your friendship and your fellowship, right? Yeah, absolutely. If you don't, I, I want to inject before you move on to your next topic on this, because I, some people may be listening and saying, oh, okay, undermining my authority. Okay, this is about Ryan making sure that he's propping himself up and staying in a position of authority. And so that's why you don't cry around people. It's, it's also rooted in service. Your ability to serve me or the example, your ability to serve your children and not putting that burden on them. It's about what's best for your children more than it is about what's best for you. And, and, and we get sideways with leadership all the time because people, that's why we have a negative opinion about leaders because everyone thinks that it's about their ivory tower and putting themselves uh, above others. It's putting others in front of your priorities. And it's you, and what I'm hearing you say, it's optimizing your ability to serve them the best and do what's best for them. Right, because one of the tenets that we have, and, and Kip, you and I, I know agree on this, is it's the mission first. Yeah. So when I'm raising my kids, my mission personally is to render myself obsolete. It's to give them all of the skills and mindsets and knowledge and information that they need to be able to go out and be fully self-sustaining adults. Yeah. You could disagree, you could agree, it doesn't matter. That is the way I view my mission. So <clears throat> if that's what I believe it is, and I treat my children like peers, or I unload my emotional baggage onto them for them to carry, am I fulfilling the mission? No. no. I'm actually making it way harder for them. The only time that I'm going to be, at least when I'm aware of it, I'm a human, so it comes out, but uh, consciously, the times that I want to be emotional with my children is when I'm feeling away, but I want to regulate my emotions in service to them. Hey, guys, I'm having a really bad day today, struggling with some things personally, so I'm going to take half an hour. I'm going to go on a walk. I need an hour to like decompress. Like you guys figure out something to do. I'll come back. I'll make you guys dinner, but I need this time for me. That's in service to them. Yeah. Not only will I not yell at them, which is good (laughs) because I'm not near them, but they can see, oh, okay. It's okay. It's appropriate to take some time off for yourself if you need it. Yeah. Yeah. This weekend, uh, was it yesterday? It was either yesterday or the day before I needed some of that time for myself So in the afternoon, this is not common. I said, guys, I'm going to run to the gym. I'm going to go to the gym this afternoon. I'll be gone for about an hour, hour and a half. Here's some things you can do. Here's food that's available. I'm out. See ya. Breck, you're in charge. And and so they can see how you emotionally respond in a positive way. Uh, So to go to the question, though, because I rambled a bit there, for George's question, how how do you deal with it? 
you do need to let go of it because there's people relying on you to show up powerfully. And if you don't let go of it, then it'll just boil over. So a couple of strategies for me, journaling has been really, really helpful for me. I have a journal right here. I keep in my drawer. You guys have seen it because I've showed it to you. It's the orange journal. I write in this religiously. If I'm having a bad day or feeling a certain way or frustrated about something or happy about something, it's all get, it all gets documented in here. That's one thing. Um, physical fitness is a good thing for me. The other day I told you I went to the gym. I had probably the best workout I've ever had in a long time. I went hard, really, really hard, and it felt good. Sometimes just sweating it out. I started to do the sauna a little bit, dry sauna a little bit. Anything but dry because I'm just sweating everything out, all those toxins and excess water and burning fat and just sitting there. And you can't really like bring your phone in or anything or have any distractions. So you're just sitting there with yourself, which I actually think can be healthy if you're processing thoughts. I have other activities and hobbies. And then I have friends, guys like you and other people where I'm like, Hey guys, here's what I'm struggling with. Here's what I'm dealing with. Um, help, you know, help me out or do you have any input or advice? And so those are ways that I personally deal with it. Yeah, totally. You know, on Friday I trained and usually jujitsu is that benefit to me, right? A hard train, still got a bruise actually, you know, pick up another bruise on my cheek because of it, but nonetheless had a hard train, but I intentionally didn't just leave the mats shower and go back to work. I laid there. I'm like, you know what? I need to just sit. And, and so I had to create margin to deal with whatever and, and take advantage of it. And so look for those margins, George, I, I think in what you're doing. The, the other thing that comes to mind is, and, and I'm, I'm just project. I mean, obviously George, you're asking, right? So I'm sharing my opinion, what works for me, but man, the area of my life where I'm lacking freedom and self-expression is usually because I'm not taking action with the thing. And so make sure that you're not waiting and hoping and that you're, doing, you're dealing in reality. So whatever's generating the sadness, sit with it. Deal in reality. I'm sad. I don't feel good. And, and, and that's be, be with it. And you're kind of already said this, Ryan, but like sit with it. It is what it is like deal in reality. If it's disappointment, all of what should or should not, should not have been some expectation not met, follow the thought. We say this often. Okay. Got it. So what are you going to do about it? But when we sit with expectations and we don't move to action, it's never going to get resolved. You're never going to feel better about it because you're going to be running your mind around, well, I shouldn't have to be dealing with this or it shouldn't be this way. Okay, got it. But it is. So what are you going to do about it? Finish the thought and take action towards it. Psychologically, there's research that proves that just taking action against the thing that's causing the issue will immediately start changing your mood. What you don't want is to fall into it and suck, you know, have it suck you in, right? And do the things like, I'm just going to watch a movie and eat some donuts, right? Because that's not dealing with it. That's avoiding it. So look for those areas to start taking action towards it. Doesn't have to get resolved, but start taking action. I think it's critical. And, and one last call out I want to call out here to what you said, Ryan, is about serving those around us with our emotions. This, this was obvious to me. It was the one year anniversary of my dad's death and he died on my birthday. And my daughter, and I have this letter, this card that she wrote, and she wrote me this card, you know, happy birthday, dad. And then this whole card was like, I know you're sad. I know you lost your dad on your birthday, blah, blah, blah. And she goes, but please get over it for the rest of us. <laughs> I love that. Why? Because the burden of me not getting over it was not serving her. She took, she was taking it on. She was sad because of that day. So I'm not serving her by feeling sorry for myself. 
right? And that's, that's kind of what Ryan was alluding to earlier. You know, a lot of people might say what she said is selfish and she's a young girl. So obviously there's kids are on. selfish, but <laughs> right. And I don't actually think it's bad to hear that. Like get over it. Another one you might hear is man up. Yeah. Bingo. Sometimes that's what the situation calls for. So in the case of your daughter, you quote unquote getting over it was important in your relationship with her. Now there's other times it, that it would be appropriate for you not to get over it, but with her, you got to, you have to, yeah. your responsibility. Yeah. Um, one thing that, a couple of things that I wrote down here as you were talking, sometimes it's hard when you're dealing with something that you might be feeling guilty or shame about uh, to get to work. I've noticed this for myself is, let's say you just got off of a bender and you have this moment of clarity like, I need to put alcohol down. The hard part of that is that there's not really anything to do other than not drink. Mm. So it doesn't really feel proactive for me. Yeah, I think men are like, very proactive. What are we doing actively to combat this? So in that case, in that example, one thing you could do that's proactive as opposed to just don't drink is you can get all the booze out of your house and you can pour it down the drain. That's a proactive action. Another thing you can do is you can jump online and you can find your local AA meeting. That is proactivity. It's not not doing something, it's actually doing something. Another one you might hear guys are like, oh, I need to lose weight, I need to eat better. Not eating feels not productive, like I'm just not gonna eat. <laughs> It's like the negative side of it, right? Yeah. And all you have to do is wait. It doesn't feel like you're doing anything. But what you can do is you can go into your refrigerator and you could clean it out. You can go to the grocery store and replace all that junk food with good food. And you can tonight do a meal prep for the rest of the week. You can buy a cookbook and pull out a nice healthy recipe today and cook that for dinner. So rather than not doing something, Figure out a way to do something. That has helped me a lot. Like, oh, I just, I just shouldn't feel bad. Okay. I agree, but like, what are you going to do about it? Journal. Go to the gym. Like, there's always something that you can do. The only other thing I would say, Kip, that you mentioned, and I think this is really important, have you, and this might be a bit rhetorical or maybe a silly question because I think I already know the answer. Have you ever had those post jujitsu training conversations where there's just three, four, five of you guys sitting on the mats. You're no longer training things about life, think about your wife, things about health struggles or how work is this or how the politics are that. Some of those post-training conversations are some of the most potent conversations I've ever had. Totally. But it requires two things, humility and honesty. Men are not going to go first when it comes to making themselves vulnerable. If, I, if I'm sitting in a post-training conversation, we're just laying on the mats, gi tops off, we're just chilling, talking about whatever, everybody's going to say it's good. They're all going to prop themselves up. Oh, life's good. Yeah, my relationship's awesome. Oh, we just picked up this new client at work. All of that is bullshit. But nobody's going to say the truth until you do. And so the truth is this. Man, I'm glad your guys' relationship is going really well right now. <laughs> I'm actually struggling in my relationship. Like the wife and I got into an argument last night and she's all pissed off because our finances aren't where they need to be and I'm trying to do everything I can, but you know, it never feels like it's enough. Somebody has to go first. And as a leader and as a man, I think it should be you. And when you do that, you'd be surprised how it opens the floodgates to real conversation, not just a bunch of dick measuring and posturing among men. Yeah, absolutely. I've had conversations like, how's life? Not good, man. I'm going in for surgery next yep. week. I have cancer. You know, one guy, he actually lost his leg. And I'm like, how's that going? <sighs> like straight up, like, how's that going? Yeah. Like, do you still feel like it's there? Does it ache? Is there pain? Like, Anything and everything's on the tables, usually in that post, those post-training conversations. Yeah it's, yeah, it's awesome. So don't leave. If you're going to train, don't leave right away. 
yeah. stick around, sit on the mat, stick around. If nobody's there, ask them a question, get the conversation rolling. Yeah. Love it. And Our, by the way, when you're physically exhausted, all your, uh, all your capacity for posturing goes away. <laughs> Yeah. So that's actually a really helpful time to do it. Well, you're so humble. You just spent the last hour getting your totally. ass kicked. So you're like, I don't care. <laughs> totally. I, can, I have nothing to hide now. <laughs> <laughs> totally. My balls were just in your face. What else could I possibly share with you that would be worse than that? <laughs> totally. We've already gotten really intimate. Yeah. I <laughs> oh, love it. All right. What's next? All right. Drew Sains. How did you reward yourself for turning things around in life financially? I'm working to find a flow of paying off debt, investing, and still doing stuff I enjoy in the now. How do you reward yourself for hitting milestones today? This question is for both of you fellows. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm actually a little wary about rewarding yourself in, and I would say in exorbitant ways. Yeah. You know, if, if you pay off your debt, like most people, what they'll <laughs> go do is they'll boat. go buy a new car. Yeah. <laughs> it's like okay congratulations you paid off debt now you've got another seventy thousand dollars in debt yeah it's like uh (laughs) i i I met my macros today so i'm eating donuts for dinner yeah it's like well (laughs) exactly (laughs) congratulations like that seems weird there's so much incongruency in that right it's like Mm -hmm. I've been working so hard. I've been so disciplined and focused and committed on this thing. And now I'm going to reward myself by doing the exact opposite thing I worked everything for. (laughs) I mean, I'm not going to say I'm impervious to it. I've done it. But I think better than that, you know, maybe a small little reward. Maybe you pay off some debt and you and your wife go on a really nice, you know, go out to a really nice steak dinner or something like that. Yeah. Um, you hit your fitness goals, you know, maybe you have a piece of apple pie or whatever your go-to is and that's it. Not the entire pizza. (laughs) Stay on, stay on track. You know, I go back to alcohol. Like imagine this. It's like, man, I just hit three months of sobriety. I'm doing so good to celebrate. I'm going to have a fucking drink. (laughs) Let's get plastered. Yeah. Like it sounds so dumb when you say it like that. Right. So maybe treat yourself in a very small, appropriate way. But I think more than that, it's wrapping up your identity in positive character traits. So when you, so here's a reward. Let's say you're 20 pounds overweight and you spent the last month, 45 days, 60 days, really just hammering it down. If you wrap up a sense of healthy identity and being a fit healthy, lean, strong, capable man, you don't need a reward. The identity, the realization of the reward or of the, of the work is the reward. You get on the scale and you're like, yeah, 20 pounds less. You look at yourself in the mirror and you start to see little lines on your stomach, or maybe you can see your dick again. (laughs) I'm not trying to be gross, but like, that's the reward. The reward is what you actually work towards, or if you're trying to learn how to be a better runner and all of a sudden, you know, now you can run five miles or eight miles or 10 miles without stopping. That's the reward the achievement. Yeah. The achievement, what you're trying to accomplish is the reward. And for me, when I wrap up my identity into it, like this is what a strong, healthy man would do. This is what a strong, capable man looks like. This is how a good, healthy father leads his kids. This is how an engaged partner communicates and works with his significant other. This is how somebody who's dedicated to uh, a, an engaging career uh, acts and behaves and how he shows up and when he shows up. And to me, that's the reward. Not like, oh, give myself something to offset all the hard work I did. Yeah. No, keep going with it. Well, when I read this, Drew, like the first thought I I have is, is what you're doing sustainable and, and you're trying to have these major, uh, rewards to make it bearable, but it's almost not going to be bearable. Right. So, so be careful whether it's this or whether it's your fitness or whatever that you're, cause we get this in the iron counts all the time, right? Guys go in like, I'm doing all the things. Right. And it's like, and that, that's, that's just hard. It's so hard that they'll be like, I need to give myself a reward. I need a break from this because this is not sustainable. Mm. I, I would suggest make sure that whatever you're doing is just sustainable, period. 
and and that way it's bearable and you don't need rewards and milestones to be able to keep going because you're not biting off too much right and and as an example from a financial perspective i don't know why this has always read, resonated with me but like the idea of your own uh discretionary spending right like you have so much money that you get to have that you can blow on anything you want and that's part of your financial plan so that way it's bearable and you can buy something stupid because you want to right and you don't feel like you're locked too harsh in but but it makes it a little bit more bearable right so I, I just look, make sure that what you're doing is sustainable is ultimately what I'm, what I'm saying. Kip, in addition to that, I would say, and make sure that you realize that there are going to be moments of intensity in your life. Yeah. Good point. I, it, it is just going to happen. It's not always you know, going to be easy. I, I had to, yeah, like there might be a situation where you need to lose 20 pounds or something like that. Okay. Like, and maybe you have to do that in 90 days. You know, I think about this when it comes to bodybuilding, some of these physique type challenges. Yeah. Those are moments of intensity. It's just going to happen. People put themselves into those situations. They need to be intense for 90 days. Good, do it. Then when you get done with it, don't go off the deep end. Just scale back a little bit, right? And that's, that's the difference is we're not going to do these like extreme highs and lows. We're trying to moderate. I think this is your point, Kim moderate your behavior so it's sustainable and you don't have to like retreat or withdraw or do something different because you're actually doing something that's really sustainable. Yeah. Those, even in those moments of intensity, if you're here and you got to go to those moments of intensity, go to the moments of intensity. But when you're done, drop back down to where you were, not crash down here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I love it. All right. Matthew Keaton. Let's see. Uh, tips, tricks, ways you have found to be successful with creating smart goals, specifically for connection quadrant objectives in our battle plans. I'm just writing that down. Quadrant. Okay, so the connection quadrant. Connection quadrant, for those who might not be familiar, is the relationships that you have with other people. Smart goals, everybody knows what that is. But with our battle planning system that we use, our, our job is to have an over overarching vision for our lives. Second is to have objectives in each one of the quadrants and connection is one of them. And then third is we have tactics, things that we can do on a daily basis to complete those things. The problem with connection is sometimes they're fluffy, right? So a connection, a, a weak connection objective might be, I want to have a better relationship with my kids. I think it's a worthy pursuit, but it's just kind of a weak objective because there's no real way to quantify, to measure to articulate, you don't even know if you're doing it or not or what it actually looks like. So a very easy thing that you can do is you can create a survey or a rating scale to find out where you are with the things that are important to you. So if it's connection, for example, uh, with your children, time spent might be a metric you measure. Uh, quality of time might be a metric. Certainly the way they feel about the time that you're spending. Maybe it's uh, engaging in new hobbies and interests because that's fun and educational and fosters character building and connection. But you come up with four or five things and then you rate yourself on a scale from one to 10. Hey, I want to be more connected with my kids, but right now I see that the biggest gap is I'm busting my ass at work and I'm never at home. So the biggest thing for you is going to be quantity of time and quality of time. And if you look at those and measure yourself now, you're like, yeah, like I'm a, I'm a four in each one of those on a scale from one to 10. Now you can start to identify what is it that you need to do in order to move that to a seven or an eight or a nine. If it's quality of time, maybe you need to manage your schedule better at work. Excuse me, I said quality. I meant quantity. If it's quantity of time, yeah. measure, maybe it's measuring your, uh, how well you do at work, your, your time management at work. Because if you're bringing your work home, that's obviously gonna spill into the quantity of time you have with your kids. Or maybe, I don't even have my cell phone, it's over there. Maybe it's putting that stupid little device away and that's something that you can do is you can get an app that locks your phone down from the hours of 5.30 p.m. to uh, 6 a.m. in the morning. And so now all of a sudden your phone is locked down and your tactic is 
no phone, no technology, no TV, none of that from the hours of 5.30 to 10 o'clock at night. Because we know through doing that, obviously the quantity of time that you have with your kids is going to be increased. I would also make sure that you include people in the decision-making process. So if you're trying to improve relationships with kids, then you should get some opinion on how they feel about it. So you do your, your survey, and then you ask them the same questions, and you ask them to rate you. If it's quality time with your wife, same thing. And then you can start to quantify which will actually allow you to measure what you're doing. And you know, 100% you know that if you put that phone down in the afternoon, you're not checking emails, you're not on the computer, you're not on the TV, you're not on your phone, of course your connection with your kids is gonna get better. And that's how we break it down to the nth degree so there's no guesswork. It's not even a matter of if this will work, it's just how quickly it will. I love it. Nothing to add, really. I, I pur- purposely, I mean, you know this, I think I shared it last week, you know, no phone at home from six to nine. And, and it's really just for me to focus on being present uh, because I'm multitasking or I'm distracting myself versus being with my family. And so um, shout out to that concept. But yeah, nothing, nothing to really add from that perspective. And Kip, a lot of guys will have something like that, but then they'll in the next breath say, but I can't because. Valid. There are some valid things there. So make a plan to deal with it. Yeah. That's it. Like, I can't because my boss might be calling. Well, you conditioned your boss to call you between the hours of six and nine. Maybe there's a conversation you need to have with your boss about how you're not available from those times. But in order to be available when you need me, here's what's more appropriate for me. Yeah. Even as as an employee, you should be able to make that. I had a kid one time. I was, so my background when I was young, I was managing clothing stores, the buckle. And I was making the schedule and I had just either become a manager or management and training. And there was this kid, I can't remember his name. I think it was Logan. And I said, Hey Logan, I need, I put you on the schedule. Here's the schedule. And I'll never forget this. He said, I don't work on Sundays. He didn't say, I can't work. He didn't say, can you please not schedule me on Sundays? He said, I do not work on Sundays. And I said, I might need you on Sundays. And here's what he said, a young kid. Then I guess I'll have to find another job. It's awesome. I was pissed. And the more I thought about it, I was like, damn, I kind of like this kid. (laughs) And guess what? I kept him around. He worked his butt off when he was there and I never scheduled him on a Sunday. Other people, sure, that didn't have that boundary, but he had it and he was so convicted in it that he said to me, I guess I'll need to find another job then. Don't tell me it can't be done if a 16, 17 year old kid can't stand up in a very competitive job for a 16 year, working at a women's clothing store, that's the best job he could ever have. And he was willing to let it go because of his boundaries. Pretty powerful stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. All right, man, I got, so first let me apologize, Ralph. He has a very long question. I saw the longness of it. Um, It's a great question. Well. Actually, you would probably argue it's not that good of a question, but it's more of a <laughs> statement, and I'm not sure 100 percent of where the question. It's kind of one of those questions, like any ideas. All right, and get to the essence of it. Let's see what we got. So let's let's try this out. Ultimately, I'm going to paraphrase because it would, it would take us too long, Ralph, to actually read it. But um, he has lived a life where he has bur- has been burned by over 95 percent of the people closest to him. As a result, right, he's learned to deal with that, right? Extremely capable, not dependent on people, doesn't worry about relationships, has become a lone wolf, has made it work, right? But has very much of that mentality. And he struggles with trying to generate relationships, right? And be proficient um, and, and actually like, be better at community and and whatnot. Any suggestions for him where kind of history has proven, hey, dude, you can't trust people. 
and you have to be alone. And he has been successful from his perspective at doing that. How does he move away from that mentality? Hopefully I did you I don't think justice, it's a bad, Ralph. <laughs> if you didn't, you can clarify and yeah. yell at Kip next week. Yeah. I don't think it's a bad question. I, I think, what makes you say, I, I think that would be a bad question or not a good one? Because it's not specific, right? Like okay, any suggestions. Got it. It's like, well, what is the area that you're struggling with specifically? Right. But. Yeah. Because that was one of my follow-ups is, are we talking romantically? Are we talking about platonic friendships? That was one of the first things that came to mind. Yeah. And I don't know if he clarified that He or not. didn't clarify it, but from the way it reads, okay. it's just encompassing, not necessarily Broad. romantic. Yeah. Okay. I actually think it's a really good topic because I think there's a lot of men that deal with that yeah. and they've isolated themselves. But here's what I would say. And here's where I'm going to challenge. It was Ralph, right? Yes. He said he's making it work. Well, Ralph, if it's working, why are you asking me about it? Because you know it's not working. So you can't say on one breath it's working and in the next breath say, but it's not working. Like, which one is it? Is it working and you're satisfied or is it not working? And if it's not working, which is the case because you're asking us about it, then you have to identify why it's not working. Trust is hard, man. Like all of us have been burned. You're not unique. You're not special. Um, I'm not trying to assume here, but trust me, nobody's out to personally get you. It's not anything personal. It's not that people just don't like you as an individual. It's that we're all so self-absorbed and we have all of our own self-interest. And even if it's completely innocuous, innocuous, excuse me, there are still things that just don't work out. Like for example, relationships. Some relationships don't work, not because the other person hates you. It's just, it doesn't work. Time, values, goals, desires, personalities, it just doesn't work. And so is that a betrayal of your trust? Of course it isn't. So how are you interpreting it, right? But what I would say to you is that trust is something that you actually have to do. It's not something that you just have, it's a verb. You have to be trusting. So every day you have to wake up and say, you know what? I trust that Kip's gonna show up to this conversation. He's gonna show up prepared. When I call you, Kip, about personal issues I might be dealing with, I'm deciding to be trusting. You could take that information. You could share it with the world. You, mm. you could do all sorts of things. You could mock me. You could make me feel like garbage. There's so many things you could do to betray that trust, but I'm choosing to do it anyways because We've built it up over time in small incremental ways. We've known each other for, what, nine years now? If, if I didn't feel that, we, we wouldn't be in the relationship that we have in the context that we have now. So you can build those up in a very small, simple way and build more trust on top of more trust. The, and it's a choice. The last thing I would say is that you have to let go of expectations, the, the, the people who struggle with trust the most are the ones who have unrealistic expectations of themselves and other people. And they believe that it's people's responsibility to make them feel good about themselves or to show up in a powerful way or to do all the things the same way they would do it. Kip, I'm, I hope this doesn't come across as offensive, but I don't have any sort of false expectations that you care as much about this business as I do. And that's not meant as a slight. That's not meant as I think you're not doing what you could be doing. It just means you have other things going on. And so I'm not going to hold you to that standard. It's unrealistic. It's not even a fair standard to hold you to. Totally. So what kind of standards are you holding people to? You know, with my girlfriend and I, it's not her responsibility to make me feel good about my life's decisions. That's my responsibility. And also, I like being validated and I like hearing those things. But ultimately, I don't think it's her job. Because if I think it's her job and she doesn't do it, then how do I feel about our relationship? Of course, I think less of it. The only time you should have an expectation of somebody is when there's express understanding about what that expectation is. Here's one thing I got into a lot. And this was, I did this a lot more when I was drinking. I had just this really judgmental thing about other people. And I would see somebody who's overweight at the gym and I'm like, oh, that person's gross. Oh, this, oh, that. Why is that my job to judge whether they're doing what they should be doing or not? It's not my job. But you know what it is my job? 
when I'm at the gym and I see somebody's busting their ass who might be a little overweight to say, hey, I saw you kicking ass today. Good work. Or, hey, I see you every day at the gym. I don't think we've ever met. What's your name? Like, you can do that. But as far as the expectations go, I think the more you can let go of expectations, faulty, unrealistic expectations of others, the more that you're going to be trusting because I don't really need a lot from anybody. Like I'm so happy and content and satisfied for the most part, not always, with what I have going on. Here's another thing I'd say. <laughs> Again, I'm not trying to throw you under the bus at all when I say these things, Kip. It's just they yeah. make good examples. If this one's going to sound a little harsh, but I think it's important we know this. If you came to me today and you're like, hey, Ryan, I can't do the podcast anymore. <laughs> okay, thanks for everything we've done and I love you still and let's have a relation and that's it. But guess what? I'm still doing the podcast and I'll find somebody else and somebody else will fill in and somebody else will do a wonderful job and it might take a few people to go through and do some tr- tests and th- we'll find somebody. Again, that's not a slight against you. It just means like- It's reality. I'm fine. Yeah. I'm fine. If my girlfriend came to me today and she's like, hey, I don't want to do this anymore, I'd be heartbroken, I'd be hurt, I'd be upset, and I would be fine because I don't need all of that. I like that. I like the companionship. I like the partnership you and I have. I like relationships I have with other people, but I'm okay with my own skill set, my own belief in myself that I don't need it from a whole lot of other people. These are all good things. Ralph, I, I'm a little bit hesitant to say what I want to say because I don't, I don't want you're, you're in it. This is what I call it. You're in it, right? This is some good yeah. stuff, good struggles. Yeah. I know it's not fun, but like, I'm excited for you because you're dealing with it and you're confronting things and, and whatnot. So it's all good. Don't beat yourself up. All I heard was 95% of people have burnt me. What's it about you? How about all the people that you're not serving and you're not helping? Right. The whole, your whole question is all about how people and you and you and you. And, and I really feel like I don't, I don't think like I have, I have some quote unquote people that have burned me in my life. You know how I dealt with those is realizing they weren't burning me, realizing that they're people and they have their own stories and their own struggles and their own difficulties. And did it affect me? Absolutely. Did the interpretation and meaning I put around their actions affect me even more? Yes. Most of the suffering and pain that I experienced on, on, on the hands of someone else was more in my interpretation of their actions than their actions themselves. And in most cases, their actions, they weren't even thinking about me. They're thinking about themselves, but yet, I, t- I took it as them attacking me, them burning me. No, they weren't. And most people aren't. And so my challenge to you is don't worry about people helping you. Why don't you start looking to serve and help others and make your focus of stop being a lone wolf, not about you and how it benefits you or may or may not be good for you. Actually focus on what are you doing for others and what model are you setting for your daughters and your kids around the idea that living a life of fulfillment and purpose is often found in the service of others. So let's serve people without a covert contract of how it's going to benefit us or if we trust them. No, you extend. Why? Because that's what caring is. And look for opportunities to care people care for people. And the irony is about this in the process of caring for those that you serve. And I, I'm going to, I don't know where the quote was or the study that I read, but I read this a couple of weeks ago. I find it fascinating. One of the key ways that you actually increase the level of care for others is always in the service of them, which isn't surprising. I've heard that my entire life in, in church, you know, you're feeling down about yourself. What should you do? Go serve someone. Go, go show love and affection and care for someone else. And in that process, you're going to feel and, and step into that position of community and the importance of community in your life. It's powerful, man. I was digging through just some articles because you said there was a study and I was seeing if I could see it. I couldn't. I know. I'd have to find it. I'm making yeah, shit cool. up, really. I have no idea if there's a study. Yeah. 
Yeah, 99% of participants of this fake survey say they feel better when they don't focus on themselves. They give all their shit to other people. Yeah, 100% of the time it works. 70%. Uh, and or if no. you guys want to do that, I have some yard maintenance that uh, needs to get taken care of this weekend. So if you want to feel better, that's all I'm saying. That's my If you want to feel better about it, come on over and uh, I'll let you guys get to work. Do you remember uh, Yes Man? Do you remember that show? So funny. <laughs> no. No? Oh. I don't think uh, so. No, 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 I won't Who's make a reference. Uh, no, it's uh, Jim know. Carrey. And he goes oh, to I've this heard, conference where it. everyone says yes to everything, and then they go outside the conference asking for things, and all the people like say yes because they just went to a conference about saying yes to everything. I don't know. It's funny. <laughs> yeah, there's some irony. Um, the only other thing I added on here, Kip, as you were talking, is just to be really tactical on this, is – just decide to trust people in very small, controllable ways. And then you can build on from there. So yeah. we talked about being a jujitsu, for example. A very small way to determine if this is a friendship that you might develop is just let some of the guys know, you know what you're struggling with. You don't need to pour your guts out and you think you're going to go through a divorce and you're like, no. Just, hey, I'm struggling with this. And see how people respond to it. If they mock you, you don't give them any more trust. If they dismiss it, then they're not somebody who's interested and so you don't extend any more trust. But you can do that in very incremental ways if you pay attention. And if you say something like that and a guy comes up to you and be like, hey, man, like you were talking about it. Is everything okay? Like it sounds like you're really struggling. That's somebody who's a little bit more trustworthy than you thought they were before. Yeah. And so you make the decision to be trusting with small, controllable information. And I think it's better just to be tr trusting as an individual as just a default. I'm not saying put yourself in dangerous circumstances, yeah. right? Like still be smart. But yeah, I'm also not going to go out and give my bank account information to the first guy I meet at jujitsu. But there might be a reason for me to give you, Kip, my credit card and say, hey, the pin is X, Y, Z. And I'm okay with that because of the trust that we've built over eight years. I'm not worried about that, yeah. right? So it builds up incrementally over time. Yeah, I love this. In fact, it's a perfect segue just really quick, Ryan, to see if you'd add anything. So Joshua Kusas, his question is really around the, the recognizing the contrasting. He's been recognizing the contrasting difference between weaknesses and vulnerability. And his question is, is how do you men recognize when you have someone you can trust enough to be vulnerable with in order to gain support to go through a season of removing that vulnerability in your life. So anything that you would add, right, of how do you recognize that or create that in those conversation that you would add to what you've already said around extending trust? How did you treat what I gave you? That's it. When I decide to give you a little bit of information about me that is vulnerable. What did you do I with don't it? like that word. That's a whole other conversation. We can talk about that later. But in the spirit of the way you're asking – if I give you a piece of me, my heart, my soul, like the way I'm feeling about something, my fears, my insecurities, how did you treat that gift? Were you reckless with it? Were you dismissive of it? Yeah. Or did you cherish it? Did you guard it? Did you protect it? Did you nurture it? Did you foster it? And if you did those things, then I know that I'm allowed to be Again, it's, it, I almost throw up on my mouth a little bit when I yeah, say yeah. it, but then I know I'm allowed to be vulnerable with you because you've created that environment for us. That's it. But if somebody starts getting reckless with the gifts that you give and the thoughts that you have and the insecurities that you deal with, that's not a person to be trusted. And you can maintain a relationship to whatever degree, but there should always be a little bit of a barrier and a little bit of wall between what you communicate with that person. I... Part of the problem with being vulnerable is we've just been led to believe that you ought to just regurgitate and throw up all your bullshit on everybody and anyone in the sake of getting it out. And that'll somehow help you and make you feel better. It won't. <laughs> we need to be prudent and discerning. I'm not going to share everything with somebody I just met, but I may share a little bit and then yeah. see how you treat the gift that I gave you. Well, and I feel like you kind of, don't you already kind of know how those people are going to react? I, I mean, maybe if you haven't had in-depth conversations with people, then maybe you don't know their mindset of how, how, if they're empathetic or if they have a growth mindset or not, but I, I don't I know. Don't I, I don't think so. No, Kip. I don't okay. think so. Not, I mean, sure. If you, if you know them long enough, sure. Yeah. But yeah. 
there's a lot of conversations. Like I think about it in romantic relationships. A man can say some things that he has on his, on his heart or his mind that when he decides to share that with a woman, there's some real risk there. Yeah. And I don't know how you're going to take this. And that could be everything from what dreams I have to fears and doubts and worries about the things that keep me up at night. Could even be sexual, like here's things that I like to do from an intimacy connection. There's real risk with sharing all of that. And there has to be at some point a very first time you start sharing those things. And I think it's the man's job to go first. I even think about in the context of love. Like when I started dating my, my girlfriend, I was the first person to say I love you to her because that's a man goes first. That's how I see it. Yeah. Like it's not, it's not her job to go first. It's my job to go first. Cause I think at that time that she was feeling the same thing and I know I was, but I'm the man, I'm the one who's supposed to take the risk. And so when she said it back, there's no risk to her, which is how it should be. But there was risk to me because if I said that and she was like, yeah, I don't feel that way. <laughs> that's a hard situation, but it's our job as men. I think that's my belief anyways, yeah. that it's our job to go first and assume the risk in these types of scenarios. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not interested in putting that on her and I'm not interested in putting that on other people either, by the way, yeah. it's my job. I like that. So in summary, what you would say is ultimately see what they do with it. And, and that's how, that's you know, and, and right. maybe the share is, you know, at different levels, depending on where you're at in the relationship of what you can trust with people and, and see what they do with what you give them. And that determines ultimately, um, if this is someone that you can be more uh, trustworthy with. And if somebody betrays your trust, then you can look at that as a learning opportunity. Yeah. Don't, don't go toxic. Toxicity would say, oh, you can't trust anyone. Yeah. That's what hurt men will do, right? A woman will break their heart and he'll expose himself and put himself out there. He'll, he'll do everything he can do to let her know how he feels about her and, and take real risks and invest in the relationship and she could still break his heart. And then what he'll say is, well, all women are yeah. like this. No, that one might've been, yeah. but not all women are like that. So don't go toxic with it. I, I have to say this, man, because I, I can't help but think of all the scenarios by which guys will hear what we're saying and think, oh man, okay, great. I'm gonna grab my buddy and uh, you know be a little vulnerable or share something right. and this is the risk that and I it's, run it's, when I use that word. Yeah. And it's not the bunny you should be talking to either. Right. Like, that, that, <laughs> yeah. That's the other thing to consider here. And, and so how do you address that? And, and one way I've addressed this is I'll grab a great book that really resonates with me. Um, five agreements, for instance, or the four agreements. I don't know what it is about him, but I love that book. I love it. If I gave that book to my buddy, Richard, and say, hey, Richard, dude, you should read this book. It's really good. And reads it. And then he goes, yeah, dude, that book is stupid. Like, I don't even get it, right? <laughs> right? Like, lame. You know, let's talk about sports. And I'm making this up. I'm not going to Richard <laughs> for advice for around some mindset scenarios that that book resonates with me because it didn't resonate with him. So that-, that But he's you not can still go to the game with him. Yeah, but he's not the guy that I'm going to go to for that kind of conversation, yes. right? Because we're obviously not on the same page and he may be even be trustworthy, but how is he going to handle in-depth Kip and my overanalyzing of my relationships with my spouse? He's going to be like, oh, that sucks, bro. <laughs> and then we move on. I'm like, that was worthless. And he could be highly trustworthy. It's just, we're not in the same path, maybe in certain areas. And so some of this is the vetting the person, not just, are they trustworthy? Well, so have you ever been in a situation where you were going to do something, and this is an interpersonal communication with a relationship, you were going to do something or you were going to say something, but you decided not to, and you changed based on how you think they would have responded. So that means that you're not being honest with yourself. Yeah. So for example, if, if you're, let's say you're dating and she says something to you or you're really excited about something you want to share and you're going to call her or you're going to text her and you're like, no, I'm probably bothering her. No, she's busy. No, I, you know, I don't think she would like to hear about this thing. And so you change who you are for her. 
I mean, maybe that continues the relationship a little bit longer, but ultimately you're lying. Yeah. You're missing out. That's not you. Yeah. The risk is, no, I'm going to be fully me knowing that you might not like it. And I'd actually like to know that as soon as possible so we can stop investing in each other. Totally. Well, and this is where you'll find relationships. I've had these uh, actually like quite a, not a, quite a bit. I shouldn't say that because it sounds bad, but I've had relationships over the last five years where they were my person. Like they're like an amazing person that I got along with really well. And they're not anymore for no reason other than I came to that realization of like, oh yeah, we're, we're just not on the same path. Not good, not yeah, bad. Just, it. yeah, we're, doesn't benefit me. It doesn't really benefit them. And it is what it is. Yeah. It's weird. Good questions today, man. We went no. deep on some stuff. Yeah. Not too bad. So, Call to action. I mean, I, I think the key thing is to our Iron Council is closed for enrollment uh, next quarter. Mm -hmm. But maybe you talk through um, your 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 fun stuff. What was the Montana Knife Company's? When is that dropping again? Maybe what's touch yeah, base so on those? Yeah. So this is yeah. Again, this is called the Flat Tail from Montana Knife Company. They are a sponsor. You know, in full disclosure, they are they're a sponsor, but I only work with companies that I believe in. Montana Knife Company, Sorenex. Um, origin, you know, other organizations that I heard an ad on a man's podcast. It was like a pre-programmed ad and it was for bedwetting sheets. <laughs> what the fuck? Like this guy, like this is not, this is not relational. This is transactional at this point. Yeah. So when, when you guys hear me talk about origin or Montana or Sornex or any of these other organizations, it's cause I use their knives. It's cause I actually have their products. I mean, I have bedwetting sheets too, but you know, I don't want yeah. to talk about well, that. Well, we got, we so. got about 10 more years before we uh, start worrying about the bedwetting sheets. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, check out Montana knife company and then use the code order of man. You'll save money when you do. And then the only other thing I would say guys is we've got our divorce, not death course coming out in October and you can go to divorce, not death.com. And there's a quick video that you can watch. I think it's five or six minutes. Me explaining what the course is, who it's for, what it's about, how it will help. And then you can drop your name and email address in. We're going to start sending you some resources leading up to October 1st. But when we drop that course and make it available, you'll have access to it. The awesome. only other thing I'll say about that is as a member of the Iron Council, that course and all future courses are included in your membership. Mm. This is, a, this is a paid course. It's going to be very inexpensive because I really just want to get guys the help they need, but there's some costs on my end. That's why we have to charge yeah. for some other reasons. But if you're a member of the Iron Council, that course, Divorce Not Death, is included uh, in, in the price of your membership. So divorcenotdeath.com, check it out. And to follow Mr. Mickler on X and Instagram, that's at Ryan Mickler. All right, guys. Great questions today. Kip and I are always trying to give you valuable feedback. We don't always get it right. Uh, me, probably more so no. than Kip. I mean, me getting it wrong more so than you, I should say. <laughs> we're both getting it wrong. <laughs> I just want to clarify. We're trying. <laughs> but we're trying, exactly. We're trying to give you good information and we're open and receptive to new ideas and information. Humbly, we're trying to share what we know and hope that it serves you that either you can do what we've done when it's successful or avoid what we've done that makes us unsuccessful in some ways. So appreciate you all. All right, guys, we'll be back on Friday. Until then, go out there, take action, and become the man you are meant to be. 